If inflation were calculated today the exact same way it was in the early 1980s, Mr. Williams finds that it would be running closer to 13% than the currently reported 5%. This is a stunning 8% difference, which explains much that we see around us. It explains why people have had to borrow more and have been able to save less because the real income was actually a lot lower than reported. A higher rate of inflation is consistent with weak labor markets and growing levels of debt. It fits the monetary growth data better. So many things that were difficult to explain under a low inflation reading suddenly make a lot of sense if inflation is assumed to be higher. The social cost to this self-deception is enormous. For starters, if inflation were calculated like it used to be, Social security payments, whose increases are based on the CPI, would be 70% larger than today. Because Medicare increases are also tied to the CPI, hospitals are increasingly unable to balance their budgets, forcing many communities to lose services. These are real impacts. But besides paying out less in entitlement checks, by understating inflation, politicians gain in another very important way. Gross domestic product, or GDP, is how we tell ourselves that our economy is either doing well or doing poorly. In theory, the GDP is the sum total of all value-added transactions within our country in any given year. Here's an example, though, of how far from reality GDP is strayed. The reported number for 2003 was a GDP of $11 trillion, implying that $11 trillion of money-based, value-added economic transactions had occurred. However, nothing of the sort happened. First, that $11 trillion included $1.6 trillion of imputations, where it was assumed that economic value had been created, but no actual transactions took place. The largest of these imputations was the value that the owner of a house receives by not having to pay themselves rent. Did you follow that? If you own your house, the government adds how much they think you should have been paying yourself in rent to live there, and adds that amount to the GDP. Another is the benefit that you receive from the free checking provided by your bank, which is imputed to have a value because if it weren't free, then you'd have to pay for it. So that value is guesstimated and added to the GDP as well. Together, just these two imputations add up to over a trillion dollars of our reported GDP. Next, the GDP has many elements that are hedonically adjusted. For instance, computers are hedonically adjusted to account for the idea that because they are faster and more feature-rich than in past years, they must be contributing more to our economic output than their price alone would indicate. So if a $1,000 computer were sold, it would be recorded as contributing more than $1,000 to the GDP. Of course, that extra money is fictitious in the sense that it never traded hands and it doesn't exist. What's interesting is that for the purposes of inflation measurements, hedonic adjustments are used to reduce the apparent price of computers. But for GDP calculations, hedonic adjustments are used to boost their apparent price. Hedonics, therefore, are used to maneuver prices higher or lower, depending on which outcome makes things look more favorable. So, what were the total hedonic adjustments in 2003? An additional whopping $2.3 trillion. Taken together... These mean that $3.9 trillion, or fully 35% of our reported GDP, was not based on transactions that you could witness, record, or touch. They were guessed at, modeled, or imputed, but they did not show up in any bank accounts because no cash ever changed hands. As an aside, when you hear people say things like, our debt to GDP is still quite low, or income taxes as a percentage of GDP are historically low, it's important to remember that because GDP is artificially high, any ratio where GDP is in the denominator will be artificially low. Now, let's tie in inflation to the GDP story. The GDP you read about is always inflation-adjusted and reported after inflation is subtracted from it. This is called the real GDP, while the pre-inflation-adjusted number is called the nominal GDP. This is an important thing to do because GDP is supposed to measure real output, not the impact of inflation. Here's an example. If our economy consisted of producing lava lamps, and we produced one of them in one year, and one of them the next year, we'd want to record our GDP growth rate as zero, because our output is exactly the same in both years. So, if we sold a lava lamp for $100 one year, but $110 the next, we'd accidentally record a 10% GDP increase if we didn't back out the price increases. 
So in this example, the real lava lamp economy has a value of $100, while the nominal lava lamp economy is $110. And because we're trying to measure the real economy, inflation must be removed from the picture. Ah, now we can begin to understand the second powerful reason that DC loves a low inflation reading. It's because GDP is expressed in real terms. It works like this. In the third quarter of 2007, it was reported that we experienced a very surprising and strong 4.9% rate of GDP growth. At the time, there were many proud officials declaring that certain tax cuts or these programs or whatnot were responsible for this excellent news. Less well reported was the fact that nominal GDP was 5.9%, from which was deducted the jaw-droppingly low inflation reading of 1%, giving us the final result of 4.9%. In order to believe this 4.9% figure, you have to first believe that our nation was experiencing a 1% rate of inflation during the same period that oil was first approaching $100 a barrel, and inflation was obviously and irrefutably exploding all over the globe. Lest you think I've cherry-picked an accidental one-time embarrassing statistical BLS moment here, here's a chart of the so-called GDP deflator, which is the specific measure of inflation that is subtracted from nominal GDP to yield the reported real GDP. As you can see, for the past 15 quarters, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been serenely and systematically subtracting lower and lower amounts of inflation, which simply flies in the face of both real-world inflation data and common sense. Remember, each percent that inflation is understated equals a full percent that GDP is overstated. If this is not lying to ourselves, then delusional is the next word that comes to my mind. If, instead, we make our own assumptions about inflation, or we use those of John Williams, and subtract these from the reported GDP numbers, then we find that we've been in a solid recession for quite a while now. Ah... Suddenly, a lot of things that were difficult to understand make perfect sense. Contracting businesses, rising foreclosures, job losses, rising budget deficits, falling tax revenues, declining auto sales, all of these are consistent with recession and not expansion. The same sort of statistical wizardry that we've just explored here is performed on income, unemployment figures, house prices, budget deficits, and virtually every other government-supplied economic statistic you can think of. Each is laced with a long series of lopsided imperfections that inevitably paint a rosier picture than is warranted. We are now in the midst of a fearful credit crisis, a bursting bubble, and the first wave of boomer retirements, and solid, credible information is what we need as a beacon to find our way out. To close with Kevin Phillips again, our nation may truly regret losing sight of history, risk, and common sense. I couldn't agree more. Well, that's it for Fuzzy Numbers. Join me next time for Peak Oil and its relationship to our economic future.